द गोल पैराडॉक्स मैसेज गिवन बाय पूज्य दाजी ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ वन ट्वेंटी एथ बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ पूज्य बाबू जी महाराज ऑन थर्टी एथ एप्रिल टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन एट काना शांतिवन डियर फ्रेंड्स वेन वी रीड द राइटिंग्स ऑफ पूज्य बाबू जी महाराज वी सी दैट इन सो मेनी इंस्टेंसेस he entreats us to fix our goal from the very outset of our journey he repeats this sentiment again and again in various ways nevertheless we find that if in the heart there is a desire for any stage including the highest one the very presence of this desire will deviate us in fact it will prevent us from attaining anything at all in the spiritual field attainment is directly proportionate to the dissolution of the i vertical when there is craving for any spiritual stage or condition it is the i that is behind that craving and it is the presence of that very same i that bars our entry into the stage that we crave therefore any goal automatically becomes the bar to its own achievement whether it is the highest goal or an intermediary one this is the primary paradox of spiritual life which must be solved in order for us to move on let us begin by examining babu ji's own approach to life did he have a goal he writes that as a young boy he would often observe his mother performing traditional puja around the age of 6 or 7 he asked her to teach it to him she started adorning his forehead with tilak made from sandalwood paste and he would feel happy that he had done his puja for the day a few years later he started feeling a thirst for the truth which led him to the bhagavad gita eventually the family priest advised him to recite rama rama which he did religiously for some time but that did not satisfy his heart one fine day his thirst for truth took him to lala ji maharaj at the very first glance babu ji was captivated he felt that he was at home babu ji never desired to be fulfilled by his master in any way he never sought spiritual advancement nor did he wish for the love and affection of his guru though he loved lala ji with all his heart Babu ji's life was defined by one thing and one thing alone total and single pointed dedication to his master his only focus was lala ji at whose feet he exemplified the state of absolute surrender resulting in unfathomable progress without any precedent often it is misunderstood that merger is the highest possible attainment but babu ji's life shows us otherwise we see that there are attainments beyond merger such a perfect identicality with the with one's guru and we also see that it is possible to go still further no words can describe the states that come after total identicality however babu ji never craved the divine gifts that he received so plentifully though he never craved this benedictions his reverence for lala ji was so total that he completely mastered every condition and stage that lala ji bestowed upon him he valued his guru's efforts to such an extent that he could not allow them to go to waste therefore he worked extremely hard upon himself 
did lala ji ever request or instruct babu ji to adopt such an approach of dedication and surrender babu ji's attitude towards his guru arose naturally from his own heart later as a master himself babu ji's nature remained such that he could not request personal devotion dedication or surrender from anybody unfortunately his abhyasis would often miss the true path as a result but babu ji could not guide them in this respect his hands were tied due to his impeccable etiquette and utter humility which did not allow him to to be direct on this point rather he tended to define the goal using abstract and indirect terminology such as the center realization or complete oneness with god in one of his letters to an abhyasi babu ji wrote about the importance of constant remembrance how an abhyasi is supposed to remain in touch with his master mentally constantly perhaps because he was very shy babu ji told the abhyasi think that i am remembering you all the time though psychologically it has a different spin it serves the same purpose he could never say anything like take me as your goal how could he when in his own heart he did not even feel that he possessed existence however the wording of the mission prayer is quite clear o master the our the real goal of human life we are yet but slaves of wishes putting bar to our advancement the our the only god and power to bring us up to that stage these lines did not originate with babu ji but were a dictation he received from swami vivekananda which he transcribed and brought out under higher orders sometimes people would ask babu ji who this master is who is mentioned in the prayer babu ji's prompt response was it is god who is the true master but if the prayer is addressed to god then why repeat the sentence thou art the only god and power to bring us up to that stage this argument is worth pondering and each one has to draw their own conclusion the prayer's first line does not indicate what it means to take the master as one's goal what can we conclude from this idea does it mean that we should try to merge with him should we strive to become identical with him such approaches would be a misunderstanding of the prayer's meaning and would gain would again send us off track to seek merger or identicality is too demanding a request gifting such a state is the master's business rather than the disciples in this case how could it ever be my goal to nurture such an idea would only lead to a situation where i would attempt to manipulate my guru's sentiments in my favor a true act of self sabotage furthermore my desire for the state of merger would prevent my ever attaining it as it would only strengthen the ins at the base of this desire at the same time we see that babu ji strongly recommended the cultivation of intense craving and longing for the goal what kind of craving is he speaking about there are different levels of craving craving of the lowest type will not bring us anywhere we want to go no matter how intense it may be for instance the kind of craving that arises out of missing your beloved is quite different than a situation in which you merely crave gifts from your beloved just imagine if your beloved was focused on trying to get something out of you all the time 
the finer types of longing do not admit any craving for the physical presence of the master in a letter to one of his associates babuji writes really speaking the frame of the master is not god but behind is divinity so i submitted to that divinity and not to the physical being but then he goes on to say if you invite into your view the whole frame of the master divinity will lag behind here babu ji is not recommending that we seek the physical darshan of the master nor was that ever his own approach darshan only occurs at an inner level and meditativeness is the only state in which a meeting with the master can ever occur in this spirit babuji adopted his own method of meditation which lala ji never prescribed to him but which he silently admired he automatically commenced meditation upon lala ji's physical frame with the idea that it was connected to the ultimate babuji would later say that it was for me alone again his inclination was not to impose himself upon his abbasis in any way it was not in his nature to insert himself personally into anyone's life therefore he could not be direct when it came to such matters it would also have been useless for him to be direct because unless a disciple can see the path for themselves such guidance will likely to be met with resistance whereas if the disciple can see that truth there is no need to say it the most sacred knowledge is always like this it must come from within naturally as the saying goes no one can teach a monkey to climb only abhyas or practice can lead us to the correct approach in a natural way without creating resistance it does not create resistance because it comes from within us rather than from any external source often it does not even give us any knowledge with which we can disagree rather it simply creates the right bhava or attitude in us this happens due to our true akhlak or character being progressively brought to light which our attitude then reflects the methods given to us by babu ji meditation cleaning and prayer are unique ones though the whole world talks about meditation almost all methods fall short of creating a true state of meditation some may derive satisfaction from meditating for hours together days together and months together they may pride themselves as how long they can sit how long they can fast or how long they can remain in seclusion however the truly special meditative states which are so indescribable are beyond their access by receiving yogic transmission again and again we are enabled to go into these states almost immediately this is babu ji's gift to the world of which we want to make people aware in the state of meditation we become deeply withdrawn and centered within we become so focused within ourselves that the resulting absorbency gets reflected in our day to day activities provided we remain careful in maintaining this centeredness another term for this constant centeredness is constant remembrance especially when there is gratitude to the one who gifted such a state of absorbency in this gratitude we simply melt away now commences our resonance with the great master meditation alone cannot create this without cleaning the impressions and desires would remain in the heart and draw our focus outward becoming an impenetrable membrane 
that would prevent us from diving within. Most of us understand cleaning as a practice that removes samskaras or impressions. But what is the result of this removal of samskaras? We are gifted with vacuity arising out of the removal of samskaras and start expressing lighter and lighter states as we design our new personality with a veil of nothingness. This newer state is the epitome of more and more of less and less. The term nothingness can be better understood when we split it into two parts, no thingness. There is no desire left for anything. No thing can draw you out of your centered meditative state. Of course, this will not cause us to abandon worthwhile worldly activities which we will conduct in a better way. Just as meditation without cleaning is insufficient, cleaning without meditation will have its own consequences. Without the absorbency created by meditation, the inner vacuum resulting from the cleaning would only attract more and more things, meaning impressions which become seeds for the future desires. Vacuity can only remain beneficial as long as absorbency is on the personality who is wearing a simple veil of nothingness. On such a master who has no more selfish intentions to fulfill at a personal level. The culmination of this vacuity or state of nothingness is the total absence of I, where you now no longer exist for your own sake. This is Sharanagati. The closest thing to such a beautiful stage of Sharanagati is surrender. To a beginner in the field of spirituality, the term surrender often causes anxiety, since we associate it with defeat. Sharanagati is not defeat. The feeling that I am under the protection of my very dear mother brings only joy. Such is the condition a bhakta enjoys upon reaching the state of Sharanagati. Babuji proclaimed, To die before you die is the way to freedom. It is nothing to fear. You have, no, you have not lost anything. In fact, you have received the greatest blessing for a bhakta, which is the Guru's own heart, beyond which there is nothing worth having. Now, both Guru and disciple remain in remembrance of one another. The disciple has taken Sharanagati at the feet of the Guru. At the same time, the Guru has taken Sharanagati at the feet of his disciple. It is mutual. Sharanagati must be true. It must be akhlak, your real character, your very essence. If it is artificial, then you may find the master running away from you because your Sharanagati has ulterior motives. Whether you are chasing liberation or admittance to the central region, it may be better not to approach the Guru at all than to go with such desires unless you are approaching him with prayers for their removal. Of course, the Guru does not wish to defy us of liberation or of the central region. Rather, he wants us to soar to even high, greater heights than he has managed to achieve. Yet, all that is good comes from the purity of this relationship, which we should maintain at the cost of any other goal. Babuji was often compelled by people's wishes for attainments. With great ingenuity, he placed a number of people in the central region who could, would not have reached there through the normal course. Sadly, the results were impermanent. They could not remain there for long as they were unable to resonate with the unique subtlety of that dimension. As a result, they fail. When 
people who were known to have reached the central region started sleeping they brought a bad name to his highness and to the path will nature forgive such individuals during babuji's times those who practiced and served unconditionally were a rarity in his diaries we find instances where lala ji remarks upon this on 18th august 1944 revered lala ji says it is human etiquette to consider oneself as a devotee and him as the object of devotion people forget this status and treat god as an instrument to serve their ends this is also applicable in the case of deities and guru on 23rd august 1944 revered lala ji says few are those who will be inclined to you and will have no selfish purpose to practice while harboring motives for material gains or spiritual progress may be acceptable in the very beginning but we should take pains to divest ourselves of all such ideas at the very earliest and become true abhyasis abhyas simply means practice it is however different from sadhana which is to practice with a specific aim in mind such as liberation or any other condition or sadhana that is accomplishment or dhyaya that is goal that the sadhaka wishes to achieve abhyas as opposed to sadhana is open ended in the spirit of nishkam karma that is desireless action we surrender the results of our practice to the master's enlightened judgment therefore it is the state of sharanagati that defines us as abhyasis the gita's eternal principle of karma thus applies in the spiritual realm as well without sharanagati we are only sadhakas and the attainment of any state or condition becomes tenuous one beautiful aspect of sahaj marg is that when i have nothing in my mind or heart to ask for the resulting vacuum automatically attracts grace then he descends and takes us further the more desireless we become the more he helps us though we have heard again and again that liberation is assured when we transcend the panchabhutas that is five elements and cross the pinda pradesh liberation is not simply a matter of crossing those five chakras it is rather a matter of becoming vacuumized at each of those chakras as the chakras become more and more refined through cleaning and through a proper lifestyle egolessness and contentment must prevail even while we are on the very first chakra can we afford to wait until we reach the ninth or tenth chakra before starting to sublimate our egofulness that would be like going to a gym and suddenly attempting to lift 100 kilos when you have never lifted a weight before in your life we need to build up incrementally as much as possible each time this means that we must start creating this vacuity from our very first day as a basis egolessness is what truly defines a good condition no matter what stage of your yatra you are on a good condition is that in which you are simply receptive and not imposing yourself in any way it is to be a mere witness in which we allow his will to take form without any interference from our side there is a beautiful story concerning radha ji and lord krishna radha is jealous of lord krishna's flute which he keeps at his lips one day she tries to break the flute 
Lord Krishna says, Why don't you have a look inside the flute and tell me what there is to be jealous about? Radha looks inside and says, There is no thing in this flute. The Lord smiles and tells her that it is this very reason, the emptiness in this flute, that the melodious music flows. Had there been even a hair inside, it would have twisted the music. Its melody would have been destroyed. If we become as empty as Lord Krishna's flute, imagine how melodious our lives will become. Total emptiness is the prerequisite of service and devotion. The flute does not decide the music. It cannot complain that it would rather play a different raga. It is the master who decides the music. It is he that decides which kind of service is required from his instrument. Can an instrument ever really serve? No flute can play itself. It can offer nothing apart from its availability, which is its receptivity to being played. This availability takes various forms. It does not mean that we do nothing and only wait for the Guru to personally come and instruct us. Instead, it means that we remain open, empty and receptive to the subtle inspirations that descend into our hearts. These are our instructions, which may occasionally come via the Guru personally. At other times, hints and signs appear around us. Mostly, they merge from within. In all cases, it is the heart that recognizes the Master's signature in these signs, hints and inspirations, whether they come from within or without. Our only job is to create a state of nothingness within ourselves. After that, whether he utilizes us or not is his business. Whether he carries us further or not is his business. To my heart, the highest goal is for the master to be happy with me. That is the end of everything. The master does not need to know your name, your face or even your condition in order to be happy with you. If he did, then this system would not be an efficient one. You may travel from Manhattan to Brooklyn to give sittings one day and automatically his grace and transmission start to descend. He may not consciously know that you are doing good work in that moment. The thought of you may not cross his mind. Yet, he is happy with you and the change in your condition is the proof of it. Anonymity does not only imply that we do not show off to our peers. To a greater extent, it means that we have no need to show off to master. We have no wish to impress him. To be contented with anonymity is sign of faith which comes when we have nothing to prove for the sake of gaining his approbation or reward. The paradox of goal is both highlighted and resolved in our mission prayer, depending on our understanding of and attitude towards this prayer. The prayer contains infinities, but one way of looking at it is that in one stroke, these first two lines show us what our goal is, but also that it is our very wish for that goal that puts bar to our advancement or to the achievement of that goal. O Master, Thou art the real goal of human life. We are yet but slaves of wishes, putting bar to our advancement. Now, faced with a paradox, the third line rescues us. Thou art the only God and power to bring us 
up to that stage. What does this line mean? Perhaps it tells us to forget about achievement because there is only main player in this game. Of what use is a goal to a grateful heart who is not trying to achieve anything? Accepting this in our hearts, there remains only gratitude. In summary, when we join this system of meditation, at times accidentally or we start with different aims or sometimes no aim at all, as we meditate more and more, we start falling in love with the various states that we come across. We start enjoying them and appreciating them and begin caving for higher states. After some point, this also bids farewell. Most of us start moving in the higher realms without conscious awareness, oblivious to what is happening. Ultimately, like a water drop falling in the ocean, where there is no drop left to claim, I have become the ocean. And Abhasi finally arrives home, a home without any walls. The paradox is transcended. When we describe a water drop falling in the ocean, we are able to provide an explanation of merger. But the stages lying ahead related to identicality are very difficult to convey. No seeker can aptly ably describe such a state of identicality that defies logic. Only the Guru will have to say such a thing. On 22nd July 1944, Rived Lalaji dictated, If Ramachandra's nerve and veins were to be opened up and the one who performs the operation has eyes endowed with vision, he will find my whole power manifest in him. Let us offer our prayer to the great master that very soon arrive at such a stage in our lives. With love and respect, Kamlesh Patel, Kanha Shantivanam, 30th April 2019, on the occasion of 120th birth anniversary of Pujya Shri Ramachandraji of Shahajahapur.